In this Fortnite's episode, you have a choice between burkas and breasts. Choose wisely. What's in the news with stories on Gary Johnson, the NYPD Mafia, and Real ID. And how to live a lava lifestyle segment on the Free State Project. Welcome to the Lava Flow. Channeling the flow of information to the libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, and agorist community. Find us at thelavaflow.com. Here's your host, Roger Paxton. Thank you for joining me this week. Coming to you from the state that is the home of the largest arcade in the world, this is the show that will bring you the people, places, and events that everyone in the Liberty Revolution needs to know. You can catch me on Twitter at the Lava Flow Pod. This is episode 28, the Breasts or the Burka edition. And it's Tuesday, January 19th, 2015, when we've already had more than 26 people killed by police this year. What's wrestling my jimmies this week? You're about to find out. Let's do it to it. We as a civilization find ourselves in a moral turning point in our lives. We are at the point where we can choose freedom or slavery, liberty or tyranny. I talk, of course, about the moral conundrum of freeing the nipple. If you've been on the internet at all in the last few months, you've surely seen articles talking about freeing the nipple. What exactly does it mean to free the nipple? You'll hear a lot about this from feminist groups especially, as a way to achieve equality between the sexes. Now, I am no feminist. I'm also not a men's rights activist. I'm a humanist. I believe that all of our rights are natural rights and come to us because of our humanity not from some deity, and certainly not some document written hundreds of years ago by men who still held slaves, for Christ's sake. I believe our rights are the same regardless of race, sex, religion, or nationality. One thing that you will always hear constitutionalists say is that our Constitution can only be applied to people born fortunate enough to be Americans. It doesn't apply to immigrants or people in other parts of the world. What kind of bullshit is that? That certain people have rights that others don't. The Free the Nipple campaign is, in my opinion, the same thing. Men have breasts. Men have nipples. Yet, there is generally no issue with men going topless in most circumstances. This was not always the case. Several decades ago in this country, it was considered vulgar for men to go topless. We have since realized the ridiculousness of this and moved past it. It's now time to move past the female nipple as well. What is a female nipple? What makes it different than a man's nipple? The main difference is that the male nipple is underdeveloped, yet they contain exactly the same structure as female nipples. Men don't receive a surge of estrogen during development to enlarge the breast and develop the milk ducts. Visually and structurally, though, the nipple itself is very similar in both males and females. So why is it obscene, indecent, or even lewd for women's nipples to be shown, but not men's? It goes back to our Puritan society that has different rules for men and women, clearly not a humanist society. The female nipple, regardless of what some may have you believe, is not a sex organ, nor is sex their primary function. The primary function of a female nipple is as a food source for babies. Sexual attraction or purpose is secondary to the female nipple, very similar to lips. Other parts of a woman's body also have sexual attraction or other secondary sexual purposes. Men are attracted to women's hair, eyes, legs, and asses. Some men are also attracted to women's ears, feet, and other parts of the body. Does this make these secondary sexual body parts somehow lewd or obscene and forbidden from being seen in civilized society? Of course not. So why do we have the same idea about women's nipples? I'm just like the next guy. I find a woman's breasts sexually attractive. I also find a woman's lips sexually attractive. So why does our Western culture find the nipple worthy of covering up, but not the lips? Now that's a great question and one that I don't have an answer to, honestly. 
However, there is a culture that does cover up the lips and everything else on women. The fundamentalist Muslim culture requires women to remain completely covered, except for a small slit for the eyes, and that's usually covered by some sort of mesh fabric, in a garment called the burqa. This is the most logically consistent endgame of covering up items that have a secondary sexual purpose or sexual attraction. Is this where we want to end up as a society? Is this the direction that we're heading as a society? Either we cover it all up, or we allow it all to be shown. These are the only two logically consistent ways to go about this. And since freedom is our goal, then showing it all should be our goal as well, not burqas. As time progresses, our Western culture becomes more, not less, sexually free. As I said, 80 years ago, it was illegal for even men to show their nipples in public. A century ago, ankles were obscene if shown in public by women. Fifty years ago, the bikini was illegal in public. Today, both men and women can get away with showing copious amounts of skin without getting in any trouble. About the only thing that both men and women can't show in public is their genitals. There's been some controversy in New Hampshire over this very topic lately. Free State Project early mover and New Hampshire legislator Amanda Bolden has weighed in on this topic, accusing Republicans of sexism in their legislation to prohibit women from exposing their nipples or breasts in public, with the exception of breastfeeding. And yes, this is sexist. As Amanda said, we shouldn't be introducing new legislation that applies only to women. If we had any laws that started with the sentence, women should not, they should have been repealed by now. Absolutely. Amanda was attacked terribly for this on Facebook by Republican legislators who made comments such as, quote, if it's a woman's natural inclination to pull her nipple out in public and you support that, then you should have no problem with a man's inclination to stare at it and grab it. What the actual fuck? Can you believe this douche nozzle actually said this? Yes, he really did post this on Facebook and it was spread all over the place. This man believes that if you have your nipple out, he should have the right to go up and grab it. And people say that Republicans are close friends to libertarians. My ass. If Republicans can't even understand personal property rights to a person's own body, then they are just useless to libertarians. Essentially, he is saying that if you leave your bicycle out in your front yard, since it's visible, it's okay for someone to steal it or do with it as they wish. This is backwards and dangerous thinking and leads to the, quote, she had it coming comments when a woman is raped when she has been drinking or is wearing revealing clothing. The comments between Bolden and her Republican counterparts made mainstream news all over the country, being picked up by Slate, HuffPo, Washington Times, and many others. Amanda handled these comments very well and held her own against her misogynist colleagues. One comment one of the Republican legislators said did ring true, though. He said, libertarians want a nude beach? Put your money together and buy one. If you want to expose your kids to nudity, go for it. And that goes to the crux of this entire issue, property rights. If people want to ban anything that they want on their own property, that's perfectly fine, and it should be respected. By respected, I mean their right to ban it should be respected. I would never respect someone who, for example, would ban gun owners from their establishment, or women, or blacks. But I would respect their ability to do what they choose with their own property. The issue really comes in when you're dealing with public property. This is the classic tragedy of the commons, and one of the main reasons there should be no such thing as public property to begin with, not to mention the theft that had to occur to pay for that public property in the first place. Since we clearly do not live in a perfectly moral society that respects property rights above all else, this is an issue that we have to deal with. Should there be public decency laws? Should there be laws protecting the moral fiber of our families and our youth? No, there shouldn't be. Do I want to go to the public park and see people naked? Do I want my children to see that? Not usually, no. But that is the tragedy of the commons. We should be taking a note from the Republican legislator and buy our own land to do with as we choose. The public spaces are for the public and its choices. Your land is for you, 
and your choices. Build a park. Allow everyone to come to it as long as they follow the rules that you choose. And charge for admission. If people find value from getting away from the public spaces, they will find value in what you offer, and they'll come. If not, they won't. It's that simple. If I don't want to see nude people in public places, then I won't go to public places. In an ideal world, there will be no public places, and this debate would never have to happen. If a restaurant doesn't want to allow women to breastfeed at their tables because the owners think that that may turn away patrons, then the restaurant should be able to ban that. If the restaurant wants to have topless men and women serve the food to attract certain patrons, then they should be allowed to do that as well. If the restaurant owner wants to serve appetizers of cocaine that you can snort off of the cleavage of consenting adults, then so be it. And I can choose to limit my exposure to only those things that I want to be exposed to by making my voluntary choices about where I will or will not eat. It's very, very simple. So the choice is yours. Choose wisely. Do you want breasts or burkas? I choose breasts on my property. You choose what you want for yours. And we will all leave each other in peace. Have you subscribed to the Lava Flow on iTunes or any mobile device yet? Then what's wrong with you? Go to thelavaflow.com slash subscribe so you don't miss a minute of the show. And while you're subscribing, make sure to leave me a five-star rating and review the show to help others find our podcast. Thelavaflow.com slash subscribe. What's in the news? The news you need to know from a libertarian perspective. In partisan politics news, former New Mexico Governor Gary Johnson has officially joined the race for the Libertarian Party nomination for president in 2016. He ran in 2012 and received the highest vote total of any Libertarian presidential candidate before him, garnering over one million votes. Johnson stepped down from his position as CEO with Cannabis Sativa Incorporated, a position that was then given to Johnson's former running mate in 2012, Judge Jim Gray raising questions as to whether or not Gray will join Johnson this time around. Johnson brings with him about $1.4 million in campaign debt from his 2012 run, debt that calls into question the fiscal choices made by his team. Some of that debt even goes to his Republican race before he switched over to the Libertarian Party. That debt will likely end up being paid by new donors from the small Libertarian pool of donors which will limit the ability of new donations to Johnson being able to be used to actually advertise and help him get votes instead of having to use those new donations to pay that huge amount of debt. Johnson was interviewed by several sources on his announcement day, and he told Reason Magazine that he would support a bill to ban the wearing of burqas in America. The reason he gave was that Sharia law was not an expression of religion, but of politics so that it was open to be banned. While the First Amendment to the Constitution does tell government that it is not able to limit the practices of religion, it is most well known for being the Freedom of Speech Amendment. Last time I checked, political speech is just as protected as religious speech. So even if the burqa and sharia are somehow only political, there is still no way that government can be allowed to limit it. The very next day, Johnson backpedaled from his statement, saying, quote, I would not sign that legislation because I think that it would end up being government intrusion on you or I. I gave reason the honest knee-jerk response. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. This, of course, he said after the major backlash that he received from libertarians around the country, including me, to his ridiculous comments. Many are saying that his retraction is not good enough. Some are saying that he should drop out of the race altogether. I don't necessarily agree with this position. Sure, what he said was ignorant and uninformed, and certainly not in any way libertarian. He should know better, and he should certainly be more on his toes while being interviewed, especially when being interviewed by a libertarian magazine. This is not just a simple slip-up. This is a major fuck-up that flies in the face of what libertarianism means. Johnson is by no means an anarcho-capitalist. He is not even a Ron Paul or a Harry Brown. 
However, he is a far sight better than a Bob Barr or a Wayne Allen Root every day of the week. And he is certainly better than Austin Peterson, known for being completely against the nap. John McAfee, known for being a fugitive for murder and starting the software company after his own name, McAfee. Or Mark Allen Feldman, known recently for asking, and I shit you not, asking Kanye West (laughs) to be his running mate. If you had asked me a year ago who I would support for the LP nomination, I would have said hands down Gary Johnson. But that is no longer the case. There are at least two people running who are much more libertarian than Gary, and those are Steve Kerbel and Daryl W. Perry. I would suggest that you take some time and check both of these fine gentlemen out. In the biggest gang on the streets news, an NYPD cop pled guilty last month to shaking down the owner of a Queen's pizzeria for illegal protection money. The cop also pled guilty to extorting $1,000 per week from the operator of two social clubs in Astoria. 37-year-old Besnik Lakatura used two co-conspirators to threaten the victims to pay up if they wanted to operate in Astoria. Lakatura would then swoop in to be the good guy, pretending to befriend the victims. He would then advise them that it would be better to pay the money instead of notifying the police. Lakatura faces up to life in prison but his federal sentencing guidelines are 154 to 171 months when he is sentenced in late February. His two co-conspirators are scheduled for trial in March. Now, I and many others have been calling cops the biggest, baddest gang on the streets. In this case, they're even acting exactly like the mob of old. Does it get any more in your face than this? In The Feds Can't Make Up Their Minds news, I've mentioned on this show before that some states would have to start using passports very soon to fly domestically since they have not implemented real ID. This appears to no longer be the case. The DHS Secretary Jay Johnson has now backtracked on this, pushing back the deadline from 2016 to January 2018. As the 10th Amendment Center said, quote, the date is significant for more than just proving the Department of Homeland Security's bluff. January 22nd, 2018 is more than a year into the next presidential administration. Secretary Johnson will be gone. The new president, whoever he or she is, will have a Homeland Security Secretary whose underlings will probably have driven the issue too hard for DHS and Congress to tolerate. And the 2018 Real ID deadline will get pushed back again by that group of federal bureaucrats. It's what I've said time and time again that Real ID deadlines aren't real, end quote. It's clear that the federal government has no interest in continuing to try and force states to use Real ID, primarily since so many states are holding their ground against it. Let's hope that the states holding firm don't cave before the feds do. In Over My Dead Body news, the GOP in the state of Virginia has put forth a bill that would require schools to verify children's genitals before using the restroom. Now, the bill doesn't really say that but it is really the only way that this bill could be enforced. Quote, local school boards shall develop and implement policies that require every school restroom, locker room, or shower room that is designated for use by a specific gender to solely be used by individuals whose anatomical sex matches such gender designation, the measure says. Under the bill, any student who violated the bathroom rules could be fined $50 by law enforcement. Schools would have the discretion of allowing students to use a, quote, single-stall restroom or shower, or to have, quote, controlled access to an otherwise unoccupied restroom. Cole's legislation would also allow law enforcement to fine anyone who knowingly used a public restroom that did not correspond to their anatomical sex. If you can tell me a way to determine someone's anatomical sex without checking their anatomy, then please let me know, because I don't see any other way to do this. This is yet another reason to homeschool your kids. In just another flip-flopper news, Senator Rand Paul has now said that he would support Donald Trump if Trump were to win the GOP nomination for president. The remarks are a massive reversal from his comment in October that Trump, as the GOP nominee, would be a disaster for the party and the country. Paul's most recent comment also came after he was booted to Fox News Network's undercard debate. When Paul was asked if he would support Trump as the nominee, he seemed hesitant, but said that he would. Quote, yeah, 
I think it would have to happen, Paul said. I think we're a long way from deciding who the nominee is. The reason I say I will support the nominee, when I won and beat the establishment, they all came around and supported me. That's the way party politics works. They group around the nominee. End quote. That's the way party politics works? So party is more important than policy or principle? Bullshit. If this isn't just more proof that Rand is nothing like his father, who refused to endorse Mitt Romney, then I don't know what is. When Ron didn't endorse Mitt in 2012, it cost him a speaking slot at the GOP convention. Now that is principle over party. It's a shame Rand doesn't get that too. In Who Would Have Thunk It News, the National Safety and Transportation Board is now recommending a ban on even hands-free phones while driving. Why? Because, quote, drivers may not be taking their hands off the wheel or even their eyes off the roads, but they may be taking their minds off of driving. End quote. While at this stage it's only a recommendation, that can quickly change. So keep an eye out on this one. How far can they logically take this? Will they eventually ban radios in cars because you may take your eyes off the road to change the channel or take your mind off the road while singing your favorite tune? Will they ban daydreaming in cars? One person interviewed for the article said, quote, if it saves lives, it's great, end quote. Could there be a more moronic or ignorant comment to this issue? What would save the most lives would be banning cars altogether. Hell, let's ban traveling completely. Fuck it. Let's put every single person in a jail cell that's just a little bit bigger than they are. That would be the most effective way to save lives. So, according to this guy, that would be great. It's amazing to me how little people actually think before they speak. In Free State Project news, FSP members elected to the New Hampshire legislature put forth several very good pro-liberty bills this year. According to Freekeen.com, bills to lower the drinking age to 18, several bills to legalize cannabis, and bills to end the prep and bills to end the prohibition on prostitution have all been presented for the 2016 session. In New Hampshire, every single bill put forth by legislators gets a full hearing in front of a state house committee where the public is able to speak to or for the bills. I challenge anyone to find another state in the country, or another country for that matter, that is trying to do all three of these things in the same legislative session. And New Hampshire, for the third straight year, has been named the best and strongest state in the union by Politico magazine. Mississippi came in last place out of the ranking of the 50 states plus Washington, D.C. As Politico said, quote, To pull the list together, we consulted 14 existing rankings from sources like the U.S. Census Bureau, the Centers for Disease Control, and the FBI, and then averaged each state's different rankings. The resulting list, inspired by American Mercury editors H.L. Minchin and Charles Engolf's 1931 series, The Worst American State, doesn't promise scientific infallibility, but it is based on the simple idea that education, health, and wealth generally make us better off, while crime, unemployment, and death do not. My former home state of Arkansas was 48th out of 51, and people wonder why I got the hell out of there. The rankings took such things into account as annual per capita income, percent unemployed, percent below the poverty level, percent of high school graduates, life expectancy, infant deaths, average test scores in math and reading, violent crime rates, well-being, and many others. Exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per episode donation of as little as a buck an episode or use Bitcoin. Get exclusive content, rewards, and help the lava flow become fiscally neutral while providing you more content. Thelavaflow.com slash support. The Free State Project is an agreement among 20,000 participants to move to New Hampshire for liberty in our lifetime. Now almost 95% to our goal, we are creating private solutions to public problems and creating a society that runs on voluntary interactions instead of coercion. 
we invite you to participate in our cause and be part of our upcoming conference, Liberty Forum 16. Liberty Forum is a premier liberty-oriented conference based in Manchester, New Hampshire, that attracts free thinkers from all over the world. Over the past nine years, this three-day conference has grown to attract distinguished speakers and organizations to discuss how to build a better society through free market solutions. This year, our headliner is Edward Snowden, live from Russia. To learn more about attending, exhibiting, and sponsoring this event, please go to nhlibertyforum.com. That's nhlibertyforum.com. Talk the talk. Do you walk the walk? This has always been one of the most popular segments on the Lava Flow. I've had more emails, comments, Facebook messages on this one segment than any other. But it's been a while since I've done this segment, so I thought I'd get back into it. The last How to Live a Lava Lifestyle in a State of Society segment was way back in August when I did my two-part episode on how to access the deep web securely. This episode may be the last time that I'm able to tell you about one of the best ways to live a lava lifestyle before it's too late. If you've listened to this show the past couple of months, you know that I'm a signer and an early mover of the Free State Project, an effort to recruit 20,000 liberty-loving people to move to New Hampshire in order to exert the fullest practical effort towards the creation of a society in which the maximum role of government is the protection of individuals' rights to life liberty, and property. I've been encouraging you, my loyal listener, to sign this pledge as well. Signing the pledge shows your intent to move to New Hampshire within five years of the move being triggered. The trigger for that move is when there are 20,000 signers. When I signed, it was assumed that there would be quite some time before the move would be triggered. That has changed, and changed dramatically. As I told you last episode, the FSP grew to 92%. Since then, two weeks ago, it has now grown to 96% as of this recording, with less than 700 spots left. Signers grew from 94% to 95% in three days, and then from 95% to 96% in three days. At this rate, by the time this episode actually releases, it may have grown yet another percentage point. This means that your opportunity to get in early on the Free State Project is rapidly coming to a close. At this point, no one knows for sure what the Free State Project will look like after it hits 20,000 signers. Will it shut down completely? Will it stay around to track and help movers? Will it start accepting more signers to get to maybe 40,000? Apparently, all of this information will be revealed at the upcoming Liberty Forum in Manchester, New Hampshire on February the 18th through the 21st. My wife and I have our tickets and we will be there so I'll be reporting to you what the next phase of the Free State Project looks like. Having said that, what if it does shut down? Does that mean that folks will stop moving to New Hampshire? Not likely. Folks that are already here, like me, will be talking about all of the advantages of living here, surrounded by thousands of like-minded, liberty-loving folks. People will hear us talk about it, and they will want to be involved and will also move. And over the next five years, many, if not most, of the 20,000 signers will be moving up here as well. But don't you want the bragging rights of being able to say that you were one of the first 20,000, or possibly one of the only 20,000, signers of the Free State Project Pledge? I feel like I already have bragging rights, being an early signer and an early mover. And there is very little time left to be considered an early mover which is someone who moved to New Hampshire before the FSP reached its goal of 20,000. I truly believe that being a part of the Free State Project is one of the most important things that you can do for liberty in your lifetime. The only thing that I can think of that I find more important to liberty than the FSP is homeschooling your children. So I don't take this position lightly. There are way too many things for me to count that have already happened in this state because of Free Staters. From having dozens of free staters elected to office, to changes in laws, to charity events like shower sharing, to entrepreneurship opportunities, to just hanging out with people on a regular basis who just get it and understand what you're thinking and feeling. There's nothing better. 
As the Concord Monitor said in a front page above the fold article on Saturday, quote, free state movers who represent 0.15% of the total population comprise nearly 5% of the House. Free staters are also targeting laws through other means by bringing a religious property tax exemption case to the Supreme Court, by challenging a state order to stop using public money to send kids to private schools, and by rallying to eliminate city restrictions on Uber. Is liberty activism getting front page press in your state? Probably not, but it happens in New Hampshire. I cannot begin to tell you the amount of fun that I've had, the friendships that I've already developed, the connections I've made, and just the overall benefit to my family that moving here has given me. My only regret is that I didn't sign and move sooner. So just in case the FSP does decide to shut down after 20,000 signers, make sure that you don't miss out. Go sign up today at fspsign.org. Remember, you are not saying that you'll move right away. You're also not saying that some crazy circumstance may come up that keeps you from moving in the next five years. As the pledge states, you're only stating your, quote, solemn intent to move to the state of New Hampshire within five years of the 20,000 signatures being hit. This gives you five years to plan, find a job, sell your house, and everything else that's involved in moving. This is a political migration that you don't want to miss. There may not be anything else like this in your lifetime. Go sign the pledge today at fspsign.org. Thank you for listening to the show this week. As always, I need to thank my favorite libertarian in the world, Jessica, for her help with this show. For the show notes to this episode, where I put links and other information that's been on the show, go to thelavaflow.com slash 28. And I have yet another new iTunes review this week. This comes from I have no idea how to pronounce it, to be honest, so I'm just going to give up. It looks like he just typed in a bunch of letters. Good stuff. Just started listening with the New Year's show. Now going back and catching up. Thank you so much for that review. I hope you enjoy my back catalog. I would love to have even more reviews. If you want to leave a review, which I will read on this show, go to thelavaflow.com slash iTunes. Every single review that I get helps others find this podcast. So please, if you can, go give us a rating and a review. And if you like what this show gives you and you want more of it, and to keep this show ad-free, exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per-episode donation of as little as a buck an episode using Federal Reserve notes through Patreon or Bitcoin through Coinbase. There are monthly costs associated with doing this show, and I need additional equipment to continue making this show better for you every single episode. I'm sitting pretty at 38.5% of the way towards bringing you more content. Help me get closer to my first goal by going to thelavaflow.com slash support. Until next time, keep striking the root. Thank you for listening to The Lava Flow at thelavaflow.com. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe now at thelavaflow.com forward slash subscribe. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast.